Hello and good morning everyone. My name is Adam. I'm Head of Marketing here and I'd like to welcome you to this ISM webinar. I know you'll get plenty of practical advice from today's session which you can start applying to your own roles straight away. This webinar, once delivered, will be made available on demand as soon as we finish so you can watch it as many times as you'd like and at your own convenience. During the webinar, you'll be able to ask any questions you'd like by typing them into the box above. We'll answer any questions you have at the end. Please also take a few moments of your time to have a look through the attachments that we have provided. Now to introduce your presenter, Alison Edgar is not only a fellow but also an online mentor for the ISM. She teaches startups, micros, SMEs and sales teams on how to improve their sales and grow their businesses. After 25 years in blue chip sales, she has developed a simple but savvy model called the Four Pillars of Sales. So far it's helped hundreds of startups and SMEs flip their figures, increase their sales and grow their margins. She'll be the next voice you hear. I hope you enjoy the webinar, and over to you, Alison. Thank you so much, Adam. Good morning, everyone. As Adam said, I am Alison Edgar, and I am the Managing Director of Sales Coaching Solutions and the Entrepreneur's Godmother. And this is my third webinar in the series. So if you have managed to catch the other two, welcome back. If you haven't managed to catch the other two, um, you can revisit the ISM, um, have got the copies. The first one we did was around behaviours, so understanding different types of customers and how by adapting you can sell more to more people. The other thing that we covered was sales process, so I compare that to James Dyson. So if you think about James Dyson making his vacuums, what will happen is everything will go through the manufacturing process. To me, sales is exactly the same thing. But like a manufacturing, sometimes things will fall through quality control. Sales is the same. So if you do have any um, questions, you can pop them in the box. So today I want to talk about strategy and confidence. So these are the, the, the two remaining pillars in the methodology that I created. And I created the methodology, um, so my background is hospitality management, and then I worked in blue chip sales for over 25 years. So it was, what did the top performers do? So when I was a top performer, I uh, won the prizes, I had the good commissions, won the incentives. So what did I do and my peer group do, do differently? So um, that's what we've covered in the methodology. It's also in my Amazon best-selling book, which is called Secrets of Successful Sales. So if you haven't managed to pick um, as much as you would have liked from the webinars, it's all in the book. So um, let's get started. So we look at sales strategy. Or to me, probably, I mean, social selling is obviously a big um, example now of how we interact and on LinkedIn, you know, if I had a pound for every conversation about is cold calling dead or alive, I would retire now in my villa in the south of France. I and mean, it's very, very topical. My opinion is um, I'm for, we do not have to pick up the phone and say, can I speak to the person that deals with your marketing or your photocopiers or your whatever because you're going to get blocked at gatekeepers. Gatekeepers have become so savvy over, you know, the years since, oh, this is going to make me sound a bit old, but the invention of the internet. So from there, I think it's really important that we do use social media because things like LinkedIn, it's the golden keys. You're going to get every decision maker's name and by using Hunter, you can find their email addresses. So, um, you know, don't 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 sit in 1984. Move on with the times. So, how do I use social media and LinkedIn to, um, you know, get new clients, to build attraction, to um, close international work? Which is, you know, I've been doing some work in in the Middle East, and a lot of that has come just from somebody looking at my LinkedIn profile. So. If we have a little look, how do I use it? I've now, um, I have got a premium LinkedIn account, and that's something I get asked a lot, but I've only fairly recently had that because I'd used up all my um, searching for companies and they were blocking me from it. So I decided that I would invest in the subscription. So whether you choose to upgrade it, if your job is full-time sales, 
I would suggest that you have your own copy of uh, Sales Navigator. So, um, again, when we look at strategy, um, I talk about entrepreneurism as well as sales strategy. So one of the things for me, which I'll cover later, is I became one of the UK's top 10 business advisors. And how did that happen? So it came from a really good sales strategy because sometimes if you have a look at the difference between sales and marketing, which I talk about a lot, for those of you who don't know the difference between sales and marketing, I talk about golf. So what I say is in golf, the marketing put the tee in the ground, put the ball in the tee, they put it down the fairway, and then as salespeople, we put it in. Marketing, if it's good, we'll put it right up to the pin, and the sales guys can just take all the glory. Or you look at, again, things like Amazon and eBay. <clears throat> that's not sales at all. That's just a hole-in-one for marketing. So I think it's important you know the difference between sales and marketing. <clears throat> but let's, let's say, for example, you are um, working in a sales role selling insurance, for example, business insurance, or you are selling photocopiers. So again, a couple of business-to-business -business services. So again, if it's insurance, you'll have your ideal client. You will have created the um, the webinar, uh, the, the avatar, sorry, you've created an avatar of your ideal client. So it may be uh, someone who's in the trades, they've got 10 employees, and they're based within a 20-mile geographic area radius of your, your your premises, something like that, you would then be able to combine things like using Google to find out who the company is, and then you would put the company into LinkedIn to find out who the decision maker is. But how do you then approach them using social media? And this is where, um, I, I take it everybody that's listening to this uses LinkedIn, and it's just so frustrating when somebody sends you a connection request, then they send you a massive email going, and I do this, and I do that, and I do the next thing. That is not social selling. That's just broadcasting. And you wouldn't do it in a face-to-face -face scenario. Why do you feel that that is acceptable on social media? It's about building the relationship. Oh, hi, John. I noticed that you're also based in Warrington. So am I. I see that your mutual connection is John Smith from blah, blah, blah company. I think it would be really good that we have a little you know, chat about what you're looking to do with your insurance moving forward. So something like that, when are you available? And then if you don't get an answer to that, then you can pick up the phone. And when you try and get past the gatekeeper to get to John Smith, when they say, does he know what it's in connection with? Yes, he does, because I'm a mutual friend of James Brown, and he will be expecting the call because I've messaged him on LinkedIn. So again, this is why I don't think it's necessarily nowadays in 2018 to not spend that additional bit of time at the beginning to do that little bit of research because, it, you know, again, I, I will be controversial. I think the days of banging out 100 telesales calls a day to no names is just is not productive. It's spending that time doing the research. So, again, I know that that is controversial because I follow it on LinkedIn. So, and the other thing is actually for your strategy, the movers and the shakers. So, when we looked at, um, so for me, my target market as the entrepreneur's godmother are startups, micros, and owner-managed businesses. And for you, again, you know, you're probably selling, in some instances, some of you to the same market. Others, others of you will be selling to an enterprise model. And pretty much, it's still the same um, the same type of strategy, just at a different level. But ultimately, people buy people. So, you know, it's really still to try and build that relationship. So let me tell you the story of how I became one of the UK's top 10 business advisors. So when I started the company... In 2000, and uh, well, I started it in 2011, but I incorporated in 2014. So it was really then that I took it seriously. Before that, my husband told me I was playing at it, which, to be fair, I probably was. And I think as another thing in a sales role or as a business owner, are you really taking it seriously?
seriously. Because entrepreneurism and sales, I feel, are hand in hand. It's not a part-time job. It's a full-time job. And again, what did the, the top performers in sales do? They didn't work just in Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. You know, they were all encompassed in the role. So in 2014... Um, there was government funding to cover what I actually did, which was great. Um, but there was £30 million in the pot. But the government really struggled to launch it. Again, it's like everything. It's how you market it and how you launch the initiative. So the advisor, so what, what would happen is businesses could have matched funding for business advice. And they could have it in five different categories sales and marketing, HR, IT, um, business support, so, you know, lots of different things. But for me, they would get a voucher, they would pay me full price, they pay half price, and the government funds the other half. So, again, it's a great strategy. So, the advisors marketplace, the, the, the list lay was on Enterprise Nation, so for those of you who don't know Enterprise Nation, I would check out Emma Jones and Enterprise Nation, especially if you're based in the UK and have a small business or are looking to work with small businesses. So Emma was the mover and shaker. Not only was she Enterprise Nation hosting this, she was working directly with Lord Young to be able to um, raise awareness of the, the incentive and the initiative. But how do you get a hold of Emma? Because she is the decision maker. So again, we looked in the last one about the man, money authority needs, the influencer and gatekeeper. So really, Emma was the man. How do you get a hold of her? You use social selling. So I had a look at her LinkedIn. She wasn't very active. She wasn't active on Facebook, but she was really active on Twitter and you could see that by the, the, the wording in the tweets and the frequency of the tweets and what she said, it was not done by automation or a member of her team. She was doing it herself. So again, if you've got the opportunity then to be able to contact somebody via Twitter, but how do you do that? This is the thing. Do you send them a message? You can't on Twitter until they follow you back. How do you get them to follow you back? Well, you share. Giving is always the best way to, before you take. So you share. I would share her content. I would comment and say, that's a really good idea. That's fantastic. Love to be involved. So then when she follows me back, I can send her a private message. And that's where, again, the top tip is make sure you take it off private messaging and actually take it on to a phone call, a Skype or Zoom, or face-to-face, -face. because by continuing to email, you're not going to make the same impact people by people. So, again, you can see here on this little slide, that's how you get the retention, and that, that strategy you can manifest into any of the social platforms. <clears throat> so, being one of the UK's top 10 business advisors, that happened in 2015, but from there, they've also rerun it in 2018. And so I'm the only person in the UK who has been voted one of the UK's top 10 business advisors twice. Now, again, when it comes to selling your profile, you know, this is one of the things. Why would you work with me rather than another sales trainer? Because I've been voted this twice. Again, it gives you kudos. So if you look at how you market your business or your role, you know, what's in it for them? What's your USP? So as a result of that, I, you know, there's a few things that have happened since then. I've obviously I've been on Radio 4 on Moneybox talking about sales and small business issues. I've been in The Telegraph, The Guardian, The Sunday Times, and I was voted one of the 100 most influential entrepreneurs in the country. So none of that would have happened without the initial part of that strategy. So that's why with a social selling strategy, it's just like a domino effect because social media can reach places that, that you know you would never have dreamed of being able to reach before. Um, the picture on the left, that's me actually outside Downing Street. I've been there four or five times now giving advice to the government around small businesses. 
and everyone in that picture, you can see me, I'm the pink one. The other ones, I got to choose them, so not only did I help my profile, I helped theirs. Then in 2015, I was also voted um, Entrepreneur of the Year Award um, for service. So again, it just elevates you on to another level. But the one in the right is the one that makes me laugh. Um, one day we were in the office and we got an email from Buckingham Palace to say we'd been invited to the Queen's Royal Garden Party. So again, you know, I think it's really important to look at your strategy because these things really help to grow your profile. Um, at the ISM, they do the BESMAs. So we've got the BESMAs coming up soon. The early bird tickets are about to close. But how do you, and again, look at your role as a salesperson and your kudos, even if you're looking to jump into a different job, by winning a BESMA, wow, that just takes you on to another level. But to get the BESMA, you have to have done the backstory and all the other fantastic things you've done. And not only around hitting target, making money, but a lot of things around your um, social corporate responsibility are now taken into consideration. But again, as part of your sales strategy, if you haven't entered the basements, I would recommend that you do that. I am judging and I'm not up for bribes. So how do you know when your strategy has worked? So again, you will not only see that in your sales results and you, you will grow your network. And again, when it comes to asking for referrals and recommendations, the more people that are in your network, the better. But this is a testimonial from Emma Jones. So again, Emma, I met in 2014, and this is what she says about me now. Alison Edgar is one of the most entrepreneurial people that we have ever come across at Enterprise Nation. Alison inspires people to start a business, then applies her skills to help them grow. The entrepreneurial landscape in Britain is a better place with her in it. So, you know, this, that's again the equivalent for me being the entrepreneur's godmother would be you landing, you know, Apple as one of your clients and you getting a testimonial from the CEO of Apple. That That's the equivalent in sales as what that message means to me. And that shows you that I've done a good job. So again, if you're getting a testimonial, that means that you've done a good job because my ethos is when it's delivered correctly, sales and customer service is exactly the same thing. So moving on now to networking strategy. So there's different ways now to network. We've obviously got LinkedIn groups. We have got, um, you know, you'll have face-to-face -face networking. You'll have things like BNI. You'll have 4N. Again, if you're UK-based, I know there's a lot of US um, listeners and viewers to the webinars. So hopefully you'll understand my Scottish tones. Um, but things like BNI, I know, is international. But how do you make these impacts? And how do you know how not to waste your time? Because a lot of time can be wasted at networking events. So coming back to the, the behaviors that we talked about in webinar one, first of all, we've got people like Little Miss Chatterbox. That's the yellows. You can't get them to shut up. Mr. Grumble. Never find a parking space. It's always somebody else's fault that he's late. So again, that would tend to be one of the blues or the greens. And even the reds, they're Mr. Shouty. <laughs> Little Miss Shy, so that would be one of your greens. Mr. Uppity, that would be your red. And Mr. Slow would be the green. So again, taking the um, Roger Hargreaves method of networking, they're all different shapes and sizes. It's working out who you want to talk to and who you don't. And one of the ways that we do it um, is if you have the opportunity to see the list in advance of who's attending, do your research. Are you picking up a theme here, guys? I spoke about it in process. I've spoken about it in strategy. And now I'm talking about it in networking. I'll give you another example. Um, Enterprise Nation were doing a global trip to New York, and you had to pay, so it was a paid-for trip. And they were, I think it was about 40 businesses from the UK were going on a global mission to New York. I had a look at the list. And one of the things, again, for me growing the profile is I need national coverage. 
um, and international coverage. So journalists are really important to my profile. So as soon as I saw the list and we had the journalists from the Sunday Times and the Mail on Sunday, boom, I booked my trip because I know who I want to hypothetically marry. You don't actually have to physically marry them, but hypothetically. So again, um, I was speaking at the business show in London last week and we did our research. I was sponsoring the main stage. Who were these people that had the golden keys to open up sales for me? So you need to spend time with them, get to know them. I guess it's a bit like dating, you know, hypothetically marry them. Then we'll have people who we want to avoid. It's maybe people that we just have met before and there's no synergy. It's maybe people, again, I don't know if there's any network marketers in here or direct marketing people in here. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, if you're selling photocopiers, is that who you want to spend your time with? And they may have an extended network that will help you, but if you're in a room with 30 people, find the low-hanging fruit. So, again, there's people who you will want to avoid. So I would kind of actively make an avoid list, and not because they're bad or they're horrible, but time is precious. But then what we can do is we get to hypothetically snog the rest of the room, and I don't mean snog them, but really get to find out whether they are people you want to marry or people you want to avoid. Separate the wheat from the chaff. I think that's really important as well. Um, but the fortune is always in the follow-up, and this is, again, these statistics just blow my mind. 48% of salespeople never follow up with a prospect. Whoa. 25% of salespeople make a second and then they stop, but 85% of sales are made on the 5th to the 12th contact. Tenacity is just really key in sales. And I'll give you another little example. Um, for those of you who are based in the, the UK, um, you'll have heard of Newbury Racecourse. So my mother died a few years ago, and we used to go to a restaurant in London every year for her birthday, and it was amazing. But when she passed away, we didn't want to go to the same place. We wanted to start to create new memories. So the year, the first anniversary, we went to Newbury Racecourse. And it was great. We came out in the money, which was even better, but we had a fantastic day. But we obviously then ended on the database of Newbury Race Course. And come the second year anniversary, my sister said, can you arrange that we go back again? And I said, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. But my time is always really precious. I'm always really busy. So I really struggled to get a chance to phone them to book the table. But out of the blue, Newbury Racecourse phoned me. So again, this is where I don't take that as sales. I take that as great customer service. And we did really want to go, but when we came to close the sale, I was driving and I didn't have my credit card number. The boy from the racecourse phoned me 12 times. And some people would have stopped, but for me, again, that was great service. I was busy. I couldn't talk. I was driving. And it was just really hard. I didn't get a chance to phone him back during work hours. But had he not continued to contact me, he would not have made that sale. So, again, you know, the purpose of telling you that is, you know, keep going. And, and even you want to get the no. You welcome the no. And, again, we looked at process. You can try and overcome it. But sometimes... Timing is just not right. Welcome the no because you can then move on to find a yes. So that's an, um, what we're talking about, about strategy. What I want to do now is confidence. Um, and this will be the sort of finish and cres the crescendo of my three webinars with the ISM because ultimately confidence is key. And it's really interesting, even today, um, before I, I touch on the slides, I wrote my book, I'm Dyslexic, and I wrote my book, Secrets of Successful Sales. It took me about a year because if, for those of you who are dyslexic, you will know how difficult it is to get the words out of your head and on to your piece of paper in an order that people can actually legibly read. It is really tricky. But I did it. Woo! And it was launched in March, and already 
It's had something like 56 five-star reviews. It has been at number one. It keeps floating in and out of number one in the sales charts. So I'm incredibly proud of that. But not only proud of that, I'm more um, proud of the messages that I get from people in sales who tell me, you know, thank you for writing this book. You have really helped me to sell. Now, again, for those of you who are listening in the UK, um, there's a lot of talk about the gender pay gap. Gender pay gap is a massive topic. And for me, having worked in sales and hospitality management, I don't actually see a gender pay gap because if you're good at sales, it honestly does not matter what sex you are. In fact, if anything, I'll be controversial. Some of the best salespeople that I've ever met are women. And it's not because <clears throat> men or women are better than each other. Sometimes women are better listeners than men. And we all know that the secret of sales isn't about talking, it's about listening. But what really has absolutely gobsmacked me is the fact that when I was looking on Audible, so, you know, I did the research and more and more people are listening to audio books and MP3. So when I went into Amazon Audible and I found out how many sales books there were in total on there, on Audible, the total was 697. So 697 people have bothered to write a book, record a book and put it on um, Audible. Yay! But, and again, I know it's a new concept for the, U, the UK, but most of the books are from North America. And again, having worked in North America and in the UK, there is definitely a cultural difference to sales. Um, I do think, again, we can learn a lot from North America and their attitude to sales. Sometimes in, in the UK we are a bit reserved and um, not confident enough to ask for orders. So, again, I do think there's a lot that can be learned. But I would say, when I did the research, 90% of the books were from North America. Only 10% were from the UK. And of that 10%, only 1%, in fact, it's less than 1%, of all the books on Audible are written and narrated by British women sales experts. And and for me, that's just not, that's not on. You know, we have to revolutionize this because are we just as good at, at selling in, in Britain as we are in the U.S.? Yes, we are. Are we just as good at selling as, as women as we are at men? Yes, we are. So, you know, what I really want is, is people to take confidence that you can do anything you want. If I can write a book as a dyslexic, if I can read it as a dyslexic, that was also a massive challenge because when I read what's on the page, it's not actually what comes out of my mouth. So I believe that you can do anything you want. For me, I used to tell myself that I couldn't write. I can't do that because I'm dyslexic. And I told myself often and often that I couldn't write. And then one day I, t I said to myself, who tells me that? I tell myself that. And now I've written a book and it's going on Audible. So you can do anything you want. So if for those of you who are looking at the slides, I usually say, who is this? And someone in the audience will say, it's Kate Moss. And I will say, am I Kate Moss? And then somebody will say, I've never seen the two of you in the same room at the same time. But I'm not Kate Moss. You can't see me um, because it's obviously not a face-to-face -face webinar. But I'm not a size zero. I wasn't blessed with great skin. And I'm kicking on. Well, I used to be kicking on 50. Now I actually am 50. But every single time I look in the mirror, I see the supermodel of sales. And because I see the supermodel of sales, what does everyone else see? You need to be confident in yourself or your customers will not be confident in you. If it's your business and you're not confident in your product or service, go away and make it better because until you're confident, you will not sell it. We also then move on to Usain Bolt, who undoubtedly is one of the best athletes we've seen in recent times. But how did he get good? How did he win the medals? A, he had a 
had a growth mindset. So for those of you who haven't um, done the studies of Carol Dweck, it's really important that you work on your mindset. But how did he get good? He practiced every single day. I ask you now, when was the last time you updated your skills in sales? I'm hoping you all say, today, Alison, because I'm listening to your webinars, which is the right answer. But so many people in sales think you know everything and you're not constantly developing the new ideas. So you need to practice to get good. Another thing that I see is imposter syndrome, so especially around small business owners, but I see it in new salespeople when they start. They think that everybody knows more than them. They think that other people are better than them. But it's not like that. They just know different things. Never feel like an imposter in your own life or your own career. If Again, if you don't um, self-develop and you don't learn, you're not going to get better. It's really, really, really important. So hopefully, this is my last webinar and I am just closing it off now. I'm hoping that I have inspired you to be all that you can be. Be your best. Think like Usain Bolt and um, just go for it. So try and get, um, to get hold of me, jump on my website, alisonedgar.com. I have got a shed load of blogs and I've just written another one for ISM around my new um, topic, which is why are there not enough women in sales writing books and putting them on Audible? So thank you so much for your time. Um, you know how to get hold of me. I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you very much, Alison, and thank you very much for your time today. Um, we This is the, the last uh, webinar in a three-part series that Alison has delivered, um, and once we end this webinar, it will be made available on demand. But thank you very, very much for everyone who, taking the time to attend today. Alison, over to you. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any questions, Adam. So um, thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope to catch up with you all soon. Bye-bye. Fantastic. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.